The best healthcare is compassionate, collaborative, and scientifically excellent. Thank you for being on this mission with us to ensure humanism in healthcare for all. This is a Gold Human Insight webinar produced by the Gold Foundation and its partners. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. I'm Rich Levin, the President and CEO of the Arnold P. Gold Foundation. It's a pleasure to be here. This is a continuation of the pandemic-interrupted partnership that we have had as organizations with Plaintree uh, in promoting humanism uh, in healthcare and patient-centered care, as you know. And this session this morning is a very interesting conversation between some uh, absolutely spectacular nursing leaders. Uh, Dr. Kelly Bryant is Assistant Pro Dean of Clinical Affairs and Simulation and Associate Professor at the Helene Fold School of Nursing at Columbia University. Judith Correa is the Chief Operating Officer at Santa Rosa Community Health in California and is this year's recipient of the Becton Dickinson Gold Humanism in Community Health Innovator Award, a national competition for that. And Tony Land is a Head of Clinical Healthcare Experience at Medallia, which is a member of the Gold uh, Corporate Council. Tony will be our igniter for this morning's exciting conversation, and uh, le let's get right to it. Tony. Thank you so much. So I'm excited to have this conversation today, and I think it piggybacks really nicely if you were in the opening session this morning and really talking about um, personomics, which that's the first time I'd heard that term, but I'll be doing a little research after. So I'm excited to lean in with these ladies and you to hear their story and the awesome work that they are doing to really transform and impact the communities that, that they're called to serve. So I'm gonna start off um, just asking you ladies to tell the group a little bit about yourself and um, maybe start with the big picture even around the work that you're called to do. Yeah, good morning, Tony, and good morning, everyone. I'm so pleased to be here um, with Kelly, Tony, and the Gold Foundation. Uh, I, as a uh, Richard mentioned, I am the uh, newest member of the executive team with Santa Rosa Community Health. I'm the chief operating officer, but I'm a nurse by trade. Uh, so I've been there uh, in the front lines with many of you uh, through this pandemic uh, and have dedicated over 20 years uh, in the community health center world. Uh, both started as a volunteer, as a youth, uh, and then moved into uh, the nursing world uh, and then into leadership uh, and always with an eye on, on serving my community because I grew up uh, in uh, the Santa Rosa, which is Sonoma County, California uh, community and I was well aware of the challenges that many of our patients faced uh, because I faced many of those myself. And so my mission is to continue to give back uh, and now use some of the privilege that I've gathered, uh, you know, across the years to, to help those who are maybe in a situation where, where I was at. So, yeah, that's a little bit about me. All right. And for me, um, I am a women's health nurse practitioner, and I just noticed as a nurse throughout my career, I always loved helping people that needed help the most, or that community that was always marginalized or stigmatized. So when I first started my career, I did a lot of work with pregnant teens, um, because when I was working in the hospital, nobody ever wanted to take care of them. And I worked with pregnant teens in foster care that had their babies taken away. Um, I've done some work with them. And then I also worked 
as a nurse practitioner in a practice where it was a very under-resourced uh, community, low socioeconomic level. Um, and I just realized I just enjoy you know, working with these populations. And so that comes to where I am today, where I'm working with people that have uh, substance use disorder. These are, again, marginalized people that are stigmatized. Society doesn't, you know, a lot of times want to provide care to them or think that they don't deserve care. Um, so most of my work right now is really going on the streets firsthand and helping this community and finding resources to help them. Because a lot of them face, you know, housing instability, food insecurity. Um, so I'm trying to find ways, even though I'm dealing with a small population, uh, I just feel like that's always what I wanted to do, is give back to these communities. And I think part of it comes from myself growing up, uh, from a, uh, growing up as a, a black woman in a white neighborhood and really facing a lot of, uh, coming from a marginalized ethnic uh, community, um, racism and, and knowing what it feels like uh, to be not treated fairly. So I think that's the passion, that's what drives me to really do the work that I do now. Yeah, thanks both of you. And maybe Judith, maybe you could share just a little bit. I heard Kelly, you kind of talk about your why and your passion for the work um, that you've been called to. Judith, kind of what, what's that driving passion for you? Yeah, so I alluded to it a little bit in my opening, but uh, I came to the United States as an undocumented child uh, at the age of three. And I was actually undocumented for quite a bit of my life up until almost before nursing school. Uh, so it's fresh in my mind. Uh, and even living in California in such a progressive area where uh, there were a lot more opportunities for folks who were in my situation, there were still a lot of challenges, including uh, you know, being told along the way that I wouldn't necessarily have uh, opportunities or amount to anything uh, and that I shouldn't have aspirations to continue uh, my education. Uh, and so that just really, you know, has continued to drive me, uh, was a driving force to go into nursing and, you know, just charging forward regardless and, and always keeping in the back of my mind that I were, everything was going to work out, um, even if I didn't necessarily have a direct path. Uh, and so a lot of the, the patients, uh, the community who we serve, uh, at Santa Rosa Community Health, we, we have about 50,000 patients and we have about 550 staff who we serve. Uh, and many of them, we're a federally qualified health center. Uh, many of them are from the community and so our staff and our patients actually uh, are from the undocumented community. And so I think we forget that often, that especially in a federally qualified health center, a lot of the folks who come to us are from that community. And so that's, it's, we're not just serving the, the patients, we're serving the staff and their journey. So now I know both of you have done lots of work in the community and really narrowed in on one focus for today. So um, tell, the, tell the group here um, maybe one specific body of work that you're focused on right now and um, what that looks like in the community and the outcomes that you're seeing as a result. I'll start. Um, so again, I am the medical and program director of an opioid overdose prevention program. Um, opioid over, uh, drug overdose death is the number one killer of people under 50. I don't think people realize that. So it is a big problem in the United States. Particularly where I am, um, I'm in an area, this, uh, I do a lot of my work in the South Bronx, which has the highest amount of deaths in New York City. So um, it starts by, I do opioid overdose training for all of our students. So I do it for the dental students, the nursing students, the medical students, anybody who asks for the training. I've done it for community boards. I've done it for police departments. If you ask me, I will come and do a training. And I'm, I have the ability to give out Narcan kits, which is, uh, as you know, um, the antidote to um, opioid overdose that can save someone's life. So I've done about over 2,000 trainings so far since 2019. Um, and then from there, the Department of Health um, um, reached out to me in November of 2020 and said, we're in the middle of COVID. We're also seeing an increase in drug use. And with that, the complications of drug use. So their outreach workers that were going out already three times a week said, we can't keep up with the amount of people that we're seeing. There's so many people now that are homeless. We can't keep up with the lunch. If you're giving out, you know, 900 lunches a week and it's still not a lot enough. Um, we're seeing horrible wounds related to drug use. My microphone's not working. 
related to drug use where people were getting their limbs amputated. Um, they didn't want to go to the nearest facility because they were treated poorly because again, people don't have compassion a lot of times for people that use drugs. Um, so they were like, Kelly, we need your help. And I was gung-ho, I was like, I got nursing students, we're coming out, we're gonna do wound care. And they're like, slow down, Kelly, you, can't. <laughs> you know, there's liability, there's all this red tape, and you know, the kind of care they needed wouldn't be help with some saline and some gauze. Um, so I was able to find funding. Uh, luckily, uh, New York Presbyterian and Columbia uh, allowed me to do a research, part, research study to find out how prevalent is this problem. Because again, the Department of Health is like, we're in the midst of COVID, we don't even know how prevalent this is. Can you at least do some of the legwork and find out how bad is this situation? We anecdotally know it's bad, but we don't have the data to, to um, support it. So we went out in the cold of winter and started a study with a table in front of a Burger King. And three of my nursing students who were uh, mental health nurse practitioner students, we went out every week from nine to 12 o'clock and at a table, we were able to um, provide um, education to people that use drugs about how to prevent getting wounds, because we wanted to prevent it by giving out these kits so they know how to cleanse their skin, safer practices when they inject. We gave out Narcan kits because we found that people that use drugs, they were saving each other with the Narcan kits, so we passed those out. We also got funding to um, supplement the bag lunches that were being given out. Um, we also were seeing patient, people that had really, really bad wounds that, again, were not going to the hospital and refused to go. And we would sit there and we would provide them the tools so they can take care of their wounds. Like we would help them, but we would educate them because we were only there one day a week. They needed to do this wound care every week. And we would give them meta honey because we couldn't prescribe antibiotics and honey does wonders on wounds and bags so they can clean their wounds. And what we saw week after week, they would come back and their wounds were actually getting better and people were trusting us. And we had some people that actually went into treatment um, and we were able to provide them with resources, send them um, to uh, social workers that were able to provide housing. So it was just rewarding week after week to see that we were making an impact. Unfortunately, it was one small community, but from there we were able to, um, now we're looking to get uh, additional funding. SAMHSA is very interested in our study and is um, hopefully, fingers crossed, I'll find out next week, provide some more funding so we can take this protocol and we can educate other community-based organizations so they can do that in their community. Um, as far as the Narcan training, I know of nine students that have saved somebody's life from the Narcan training. Um, between being in a club and finding somebody slumped over, slumped over in the bathroom to, um, we had three saves just on our street where our school is located. So that to me keeps me going, to know that that little 15 minute training that I did, that Narcan kit that I gave them actually saved somebody's life. That is the most rewarding and that's what keeps me going. Oh, you probably don't need it. Yeah, so a little bit about the work um, that I've had the, the privilege of taking on with my team. Uh, so as I mentioned, we at Santa Rosa Community Health serve uh, 50,000 patients. Uh, and actually, something I didn't share at the beginning was that we were hit very hard by the California wildfires in 2017. So we were actually one of the uh, centers, I think maybe one of the only who lost a health center. So we lost our largest health center, which housed about 25,000 of our patients. So if you do those calculations, about half of the, the population. Uh, with that, and so 2017, uh, you know, fast forward to 2020 and the COVID pandemic, we had actually acquired what are called clinics in a can. Uh, and if you look, look it up, it's actually used in third world, world countries, and we use that along with leasing other space uh, to supplement the loss of all of the exam rooms, the space for our staff, and we had those stationed at one of our dental, or at our dental clinic, and so that uh, set us up for some success with um, the body of work around COVID uh, testing. So I, along with uh, a physician leader and some of our other operational leaders, took on the task of setting up the testing site, which was open for uh, a centralized testing site, which was open for all of our patients. And even for the community, we were the go-to for uh, the police department. So as they were seeing waves of the pandemic come through, we would open up the testing site for them. So it was something that was operated Monday through Friday um, and, and on the weekends at times. And 
So we would use those, those clinics in a can either uh, for any of our special needs patients who maybe couldn't sit in what we set up uh, to be a drive-through. Uh, and so, so we set up a drive-through COVID testing site, more of a drive-up. Uh, and so they, um, we had a, a centralized station inside with our nurses, with the rest of our care team, uh, who would be screening patients to see you know, what needs they had. And as the pandemic continued, we realized that a lot of our patients were being left behind. A lot of our community members were being left behind, uh, especially those marginalized communities like, uh, like we were mentioning, uh, unfortunately were getting hit the hardest. And some of those were the undocumented um, uh, undocumented community members who did not have access to things like uh, the federal stimulus checks, uh, right? And so we were asking folks uh, to, to stay home uh, and our Latinx community was hit, getting hit at about, uh, at the peak uh, in our community at about 90% of the tests that were positive were from our Latinx community, only 27% of the community was Latinx. So if you see that disparity right there. Uh, however, we were asking folks to do something and we weren't really setting them up for success. And so we quickly not only put together this COVID testing site, but then also really partnered with lots of community members, uh, including our county health department and our community-based organizations, because as we were learning this morning, this is something that we can't do alone, right? Uh, in healthcare with um, social determinants of health, we're not necessarily the experts in housing and financial management, uh, food crisis. And so what we did is we put all of these brains together uh, and at the testing site, it just continued to evolve to not just include testing for COVID, but then uh, we would connect them with a local resource that became available for financial aid. So for, it was available for undocumented folks and so they got a stipend uh, so to subsidize some of their isolation period. They also received food kits. So anything from not just your canned food, but uh, things like uh, dairy, meat, that wasn't necessarily available at the regular uh, food. Um, uh, food distribution sites uh, and then so with a caseworker and so just a whole host of you know person-centered care uh, and so that it was a one-stop shop and so yeah that's a little bit about what we did okay so question that comes to mind to me so many pieces of the puzzle like how do you ignite that how do you actually get all these people on the same page um, in a collective vision to, to create work. I mean, that's what both of you did with the work that you've moved forward within your community. And I think for many of us, we know the problems are there, but that collaboration is such a barrier. So how did you, how did you move past that? What advice would you give there? Mm. Yeah. Um, like I said, they came to me for help, um, but I would say, the most important thing is finding people who are also passionate about the work that you do and really establishing those relationships because when I first started doing the work, the outreach workers, I'll be honest, didn't trust us. You were like, you're coming from a big university, all you want to do is study our patients and you're going to do your work, then you're going to leave. So I had to build that trust. I had to go out there and prove to them, I'm going to go out with you in these streets and I'm going to, you know, you're going to, um, I want you to know that this isn't just a job for me. This is something I really care about, that I'm really passionate about, because this isn't even part of my job. I'm doing this as something that uh, is important. Um, so I think finding who are those stakeholders that you can work with, and how can they give to the project? What are their strengths that they bring to the project? And just really communication, that was the key too. Getting us all at the table and, and, and coming up with a plan together, not just being, this is what we're gonna do and I need you to do this, this, and this. Really working together with these community-based organizations and that's how you come up with, you, the brainstorm, you come up with great ideas, things that you're not even thinking of. And I think that's the same for any project that you work on. So, so much of what you say echoes with what, with what we did, which was uh, engaging uh, community health workers uh, or promotoras or promotores 
uh, more efficiently because they've always, especially in community health, been the root of the work that we do. And in some ways, some of this work that we're describing goes back to those roots of, of medicine and community health. And so 100% had to build trust uh, with, with those, whether official or unofficial community health workers, um, especially the unofficial ones, because those are the ones that drive a lot of movement in the community. And so with this committee, with this county committee, we engage the community-based organizations. And so those who weren't necessarily, you know, employed by healthcare, uh, especially were the ones that quickly spread the word and, you know, brought in folks and created that trust for us. Uh, and that was huge and moving. If you look at some of the numbers in Sonoma County, they started leveling off a little bit more um, with all of these intensive uh, efforts. Yeah, so trust, music to my ears, those who know me or follow me on LinkedIn know I'm, I'm often talking about trust and truly trust and that relationship being foundational to improving outcomes for, you know, for patients, families, you know, and communities. Um, so let me just ask you guys, okay, you're doing this work in the next one, three, five years. Where do you see the work going? What do you think that looks like? You want to go, Yudith? Yeah, so I think it... It's just, again, I mentioned it previously that it, it's a reminder to go back to those roots of getting to know people, getting to know your stakeholders, being okay with not knowing everything and relying on your community to give you those answers because uh, they know, they know why they're not coming in. Uh, and, and if we listen long enough, uh, they'll share and they'll be open about why. My hope is that we're gonna see a reduction in people dying from drug overdose. We went up 37% uh, during COVID. So I'm hoping that people that are doing the work and they have the evidence that what they're doing is, is working, let's spread that, let's not keep that a secret. Let's let other facilities, other CBOs know that we found that this works in our community. Maybe it doesn't work in yours, but um, let's share those ideas so that we can all work collectively to get that number down. So my hope is that we're gonna to start to see a decline and uh, we'll have more access to treatment, we'll have more access to resources, and really, most importantly, um, treat people, as if we're here for humanism, um, think about the person, you know, don't label people, don't stigmatize people. If we can work on that, I think that would make a big difference. Five minutes left. <laughs> yeah, so su such good points and, you know, we often know that the biases can be there, um, you know, in underserved communities. And I will even say, how do I make sure I'm self-checking um, before I engage with people so that those biases don't show up um, in the care that, that I'm providing. So um, I do want to end with one thing. And so I, I love the work that both of you are doing. I actually did some work myself. Um, I was a chief experience officer in Odessa, Texas. So right near El Paso. And so learned a lot about serving rural communities and how different that is um, than the urban environment and had my own family members who have, have died from, from drug overdoses. So definitely understand both of those experiences and the stigmas that can go into providing care. So as we look at these leaders who are in the room, and you think about maybe one or two things that you would say, okay, when you leave here and you go out, um, I'll say Thursday, because tomorrow's another <laughs> conference day, so you go out Thursday, what, what could they do? What one thing, one or two things would you tell them that they could do? Judith, you wanna go first? Yeah, I think first and foremost is don't be afraid to uh, put yourself in uncomfortable situations. Um, that's where I find that I learn the most uh, in some ways, you know, going outside of the healthcare world and going into some of these, uh, whether it was community-based organizations or community health worker spaces, I didn't really know what to expect. And so when you're feeling uncomfortable, that's where you know you're gonna learn the most. And, and supporting your staff as leaders, especially with, with engaging in those spaces and giving them time to do that so that uh, we can get back to those roots and that person-centered care. Uh, uh, two things I can think of. Um, everybody can make a change. Everybody can, even a small thing, the smallest thing I can think of is in your community, see what it takes to get opioid overdose training. Almost every state has 
some kind of training where you can go through, could be five, could be 10 minutes, and get a Narcan kit. Carrying that Narcan kit can save lives. Because every student that carried one, they didn't think they were going to use it that day, but they did. Um, and then the other thing I would say is just when we think about these populations, such as people that use drugs, people with uh, mental health illness, all these, again, stigmatized communities, let's show some compassion. That's the main thing, I think, you know, that they are people too. They are mothers, they are fathers, they could be our family members. A lot of them were my family members. So just that, don't isolate them. You know, I remember growing up and we knew who, who had the substance use disorder and they were never invited to the barbecue. They weren't invited to your house. When they came over, you blocked everything up. That doesn't help the situation. Understand that it really is a true disorder and that there is treatment and people can get better. But let's not give up on them. Thank you so much, and I do want to open up. We have a couple of minutes for any, any questions, but thanks to these ladies, so I will use three words that Brene Brown often uses, um, vulnerability, um, bravery, and courage, and that's what it takes to create um, this, kind of, this kind of change. Thank you, ladies, for your, for your service. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> any questions? We do have, it looks maybe a minute and a half or so. had to say it hit home with us. We're from Far Rockaway, Queens in New York. Okay, you understand. Okay. And so the community that we serve, they can be um, very challenging at times. And yes, we, we recently took a course in, um, from New York City. They offered the um, course for the Narcan training, sent us the Narcan kit, so forth and so on. And as well, our director, she was that, like a pet peeve in reference to the social determinant of health dealing with the health or the food disparities in our community. Unfortunately, what we're going through now is it seems that because it's such a high demand from everywhere, they don't have enough food now to even give to the people that actually need it. So that's a new up and coming concern. However, I want you both to know that, you know, we've, we both have those same concerns in our community and we're working hard with our patients, um, you know, definitely from a nursing aspect. And, I really like what you were saying in reference to the wound care and how you address that in the community, especially because our patients, it's a lot of African Americans and they do not trust healthcare. They do not trust us and it's very difficult at times, but we continue to chip at it, you know, mm -hmm. and do what we can. So I really appreciate both what you had to say. It was very informing. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. We'll take this one. Thanks. First of all, I'm a nurse as well, and I am so proud of what you guys just did in this presentation and also your work. And I think that it reminds me of when physicians were in the community and really connected to what the community needed, and now I'm seeing nurses, advanced nurses, being able to be in the community, being connected, and I think that we need so much more of this, um, and I really wonder, do you have a connection across country of nurses doing this that you can collaborate with and get information out to the public so that we get more nurses to want to be out and be connected in the community this way? Because I think that movement has to take place and it needs to be national. The other thing I, I really would like to see is that training around the stigmatization of mm -hmm. drug use and mental health for emergency department personnel because, and intensive care personnel. Those, that's where people might get help, but when they get the treatment because people have their own biases, mm -hmm. that it prevents people from being welcomed into the emergency department and prevents them from getting the right kind of care and getting connected to the community resources. That connection has to be so much closer. So anything that you guys can do for that, I think will really help so I appreciate everything you did. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Did you guys have any quick response for her? Uh, quickly, I know we're running out of time. Um, referring to how do we get more students, it's up to our schools. We need to have different clinical placements. We're always putting students in a hospital, hospital, hospital. Yeah. That's not where the only place for care. Why are we not putting them into some of the homeless shelters or some of these community-based organizations? Because let me tell you, it is a great clinical experience. And it helps to decrease that stigma, stigmatization that 
an implicit bias that we face when you're out there working with these individuals, realize they're just like everybody else that unfortunately had something happen that ended them in this situation. So that's the first place I would start is, is let's diversify where we're sending our students. The second thing is, yes, there are programs. We definitely need more implicit bias training among our healthcare workers, not just students, um, because think of somebody that comes in with an overdose. Do they really get a proper follow-up or referral? We give them Narcan, they get over, we release them. If I had diabetes or cancer, I would have a referral before I leave. But for some reason, when it comes to mental illness and substance use disorder, it's not the same. So New York, it's, um, for example, we have something called a relay program. When somebody has an overdose, there is a, a peer worker that comes in, visits that patient, gives them information about getting treatment, gives them a Narcan kit, gives them a little, it's a cute little kit, it has some food and some um, information about getting, uh, getting help. So I think we just need to start with those programs, whether at a city level, state level, uh, but hopefully make them more accessible and, and widely uh, throughout the United States. That's a start. No, I think, you hit the nail on the head with the, in terms of nursing school, that's something that I've been, you know, preaching about in, in my community where, you know, I started in the community health world since a very young age and had, had the ability to be exposed to it. Uh, and I saw that a lot of my colleagues didn't. Uh, and I feel like it's a huge gap. And so we certainly uh, open our arms to any nursing students or any other health profession students who like to come into our community health centers so that they can see what, you know, that, that's where a lot of the prevention and the bulk of the work happens, right? There's soup, all the work that we do is so important uh, and we need to focus on prevention. Thank you so much and thank you for your time.